This way, but that's not gonna. No, yeah, it's on, the air. on the air, like this. Oh, I see. Okay, interesting. <laughs> okay, very good. Good morning. So, um, so, this morning I thought I would basically review some basic principles of uh, Friedman, Robertson, well, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker cosmologies, which I, I'm, I'm assuming that you all have some basics of cosmology, but I wasn't sure exactly what, so. Okay, so I will start. I will start with this review, and I must say, so I typeset uh, notes, which I will make available to you, okay, where there are quite some details, so, I mean, basically you don't have to, I'm not going to write everything on the blackboard, and, um, I mean, you of, of course don't have to worry too much about, you know, taking notes, I mean, you will get them at the end, all right? So, uh, basically it starts from some observational facts. which is known as the cosmological principle. Which is uh, basically uh, at the level of observations, the fact that uh, the universe appears to be homogeneous and isotropic on sufficiently large scales. Okay, you all heard about that, right? Okay, so what we want to do from this is that we want to uh, go from this observational fact and try to formalize this a bit more. Okay, so the way to formalize this is, of course, to go to general relativity and to write down a metric that basically is consistent with homogeneity and isotropy on sufficiently large scale. Okay, so that basically, that's what this first part will be about. It will be about this idealized homogeneous and isotropic universe. And then starting from tomorrow, we will see a bit how basically Fluctuations around this homogeneous and isotropic uh, uh, universe uh, grow uh, with time. So, can you read my script here? <laughs> yeah, is it okay? My writing is clear enough. So, okay, so here I need to introduce some, some definitions. First of all, I will use a metric signature which is minus for the time time and then plus for the space space uh, space components okay which implies that uh, basically for vector v okay will be basically time like if its uh, scalar product is uh, negative then it's going to be space like okay when it's positive and obviously it's light like when it is zero. Okay. Um, so let me go immediately to the special metric because I guess you all know this, all right? So the metric, the most general metric compatible with the cosmological principle is the FRW metric and it takes the form So what is important here is that there is basically a preferred set of observers which are known as co-moving observers. And all these observers, they basically see the same homogeneous and isotropic universe. And they will be able to write down a metric of this form, okay? 
and use this coordinate system to describe the evolution of this idealized homogeneous and isotropic universe. Okay? And so they can all agree, basically, they, they could, they all see the same universe, they could exchange information about what they see, and then so as to define a preferred time, which is a preferred time coordinate, which is known as the cosmic time, T. And then because the universe that they see can actually expand, what they will use as basically spatial coordinate are the so-called co-moving coordinate X. Okay? And then to go basically from co-moving coordinates to physical for coordinate, you introduce the scale factor A of T. Okay? which can only be a function of time. It cannot be a function of position, because otherwise, basically, it would break the homogeneity, OK? So move this that way. Oh, very convenient. I will basically often use. Uh, spherical coordinates because of the homogeneity and, and isotropy. So in spherical coordinates, basically, the co-moving coordinate xi, they will be of, of this form. You have x1, which will be some radial co-moving coordinate. Chi, it's a chi. times sin theta cos phi, uh, x2 chi sin theta sin phi, and x3 theta, okay? So as in our usual three-dimensional space. Now, so the properties of this uh, FRW universe, they are, basically they are basically encoded in the space-space part of the metric. And so there, basically, the freedom is the following. There is very little freedom. Basically, so once you have defined this cosmic time, okay, then you are, you can, you're basically slicing the space into surfaces of constant time, okay, that defines a certain slices in, of space into three-dimensional hypersurfaces of constant time. And then the only freedom that you have, which is compatible with the uh, cosmological principle, is basically the average curvature, is the curvature of these uh, hypersurfaces of constant time. So, how did I write it? Um. So it's basically about the sign of the curvature k of the surfaces of constant coordinate time. All right, so just to imagine this, so here you have time this way, okay, and then I start and then I define these surfaces at constant time. Okay, each of them for, okay. Okay, and then I ask, okay, so what's the sign basically, what's the sign of the curvature of these surfaces? And that basically, once this is given, then you have fully specified what the metric is, up to, obviously, the time evolution of the scale factor A of t, which we will look at it later, okay? So you have basically, essentially, three uh, possibilities. First of all, you could have a flat, 
flat slicing, so basically these surfaces of constant time are just flat, so the curvature is zero. Okay, so the curvature k is zero. Then you could have uh, basically surfaces with k greater than zero, so you would have some sort of um, hypersphere, for instance. All right, in this case. Otherwise, third possibility, you have hyperbolic spaces. In which case, k is defined as negative. Okay, and what is important is that this k, okay, is constant. That's what comes out from basically requiring homogeneity and isotropy uh, as uh, suggested by observational fact. So there is a way basically to unify this uh, three type of, of uh, different curvature in, in the metric. And um, to do this, you can introduce some generalized trigonometric functions. as follows. So for instance, you can define a sign, a sinus sign of, that will depend on some argument. This argument will be basically the radial coordinate chi, and you introduce a dependence on the curvature of space, okay, of these surfaces of constant time as follows. So you define it as k to the minus one half sin k one half chi when k is greater than zero, okay? That would be the case of the sphere, the usual sinus, basically. When k, when you have a flat space-time, okay, uh, when you have a flat, uh, flat, uh, flat sections of constant time, then what you have actually is simply chi in this case. That's the usual, you have the usual Euclidean space in three dimensions. So basically distances are the, Basically, this, is, this reduces to the, the, just the radial coordinate, okay, your R if you want, okay, chi. And when you have hyperbolic space, it's convenient to define this function, sin k of chi, as a sin hyperbolic, now you need to put minus k times chi. Okay? And you can do the same, you can introduce a cosine, etc., etc. And the bottom line is that, obviously, what will happen is that depending on, depending on the nature of these three-dimensional hypersurfaces, chi could vary from zero to infinity or could be bounded. Okay, I will not discuss this. I will just write down the metric, the most general metric that unifies all these different FRW universes, and so there is one convenient form, which is the following. ds squared is written as follows. Okay, so now, you ha now basically we use the spherical coordinates for the space space part, so I put the scale factor in front, and then you will write it as follows, using this generalized sin function. First you, are, you have the radial part, and then what multiplies the angular part with the theta and phi is actually modul modulated by this extra sine k of chi function. Okay? That's a first form. 
So then, depending simply depending on the sign of the curvature of these surfaces of constant time, you pick up the right expression for this generalized sin cape function. Okay? There is another way to write this down. So you do it the following. You substitute R. You said R is sin k of chi. If you do that, do this substitution, you get to yet another form of this metric. So this form, so let, let me say something here. So this form is very convenient for studies of anisotropies uh, because if you, if you want the metric, you see the metric, uh, the, metric uh, the component of the metric tensor are, are relatively simple. Okay, this form is not, very is not very convenient for such studies because there is this one over one minus k r squared. But at least there is one advantage when uh, writing the metric in this form is the fact that, I mean, I see clearly that the effect of the curvature of space will become important when R square is of order 1 over K. And maybe I should not write in. Uh, that's what I, I read off from here. R, so effect of curvature becomes important when R squared is of order of 1 over K. Okay? Or, obviously, R goes like 1 over square root of K. Okay, so basically, this suggests defining a curvature radius of the universe. So, based on this, we define the curvature radius of this FRW universe simply as R curvature is basically the scale factor times this one over square root of K. Okay, which I need to take obviously in absolute value for it to make really sense. Okay, so then you see, right, you st because a, a of t might change with time, then the curvature will actually change with time. The curvature of this three-dimensional hypersurfaces of constant time will change with time. If you have an expanding universe, the scale factor a of t will grow, and so the radius of curvature becomes bigger, which means that the, curve act the curvature actually becomes less important, becomes weaker. Okay? So there is something else also to say here, which is a question of, of what's, I mean, what's your convention for the scale factor A and K? Because there is, there is some freedom here. Basically, the freedom is where do you want to put what, which of these two quantities as unit and which of, of, of A and K as no unit, okay? Look at this. So you have here, let me say one more thing. I forgot to tell you at the beginning. I use natural units. Okay, so I will be, I will set speed of light is h bar is Boltzmann constant is one. Nearly all the time, except in some specific uh, occurrences where this is needed, okay? So this D, this here has unique unit of length squared, right? So this old thing has, needs to have unit of length squared, right? So there are basically two options. The first option will be to say, okay, I will do the following. I give to R or to chi, I give unit of length, then this has unit of length squared, and so I take the scale factor to have no units, okay? The, sec the second possibility is to actually give the scale factor unit of length, Okay, so that your R has new units, okay, and then your K, of course, has also no units. Do you get it? 
there are two options, right? So here you have A goes like length, right? If you have gay that goes like length, uh, this means that k has no units. Okay, k has no units if a goes like length, right? Because this will go like length, this goes like th length, so this has no units, okay? The second possibility is to say that a has actually no units, which is the standard choice. Okay, and then R or K will have units of length. R and K, they all have units of length, such as well as actually K, okay? Okay? It's not clear? Questions? So, I will go for this choice. Okay? The scale factor has no units. Chi or R have units of length, as usual. Okay? It's a distance. Okay? Unit of length. And then this implies that obviously K must also have units in this case, right? Just to cancel the factor of length squared that you would get here. Okay? So k would have units of 1 over length squared. Do you agree with me? I read, off, I read this up from that metric. Okay? 1 over k, square root will give me the length needed for r, and a has no unit. All this makes sense, okay? So that's, that's the choice. And then if you do this choice, what you can do is the following. So you basically give k unit of 1 over... Sorry, I made a mistake here, yeah. Um, I meant k goes like length to the minus 2. Okay, sorry for that. So if you go for this choice, what you will do is that you have here the scale factor which has no units. You can normalize it to unity today. So if you have an expanding universe, it will be always smaller than unity in the past. Okay. And then the curvature k goes like 1 over the length squared. Okay. But k can basically have any value, I mean, negative or positive. If you go for the first choice, what you could do is the following. Then you could actually normalize k in such a way that then k becomes minus 1 if you have a hyperbolic space, obviously 0 if it's flat, and then plus 1. Okay? But then your scale factor a needs to have a dimension on length, of length. That's the second possibility. So let me say one more thing now about this metric. There is one more transformation you can do. You can introduce a new coordinate time, which is known as conformal time. So the conformal time, you define it as follows. Such that you rewrite, if you want, the dt as a eta times d eta. And that brings the FRW metric into the following form. Okay, which you can, so, you can see that if you have basically flat sections, okay, so flat, uh, spa uh, uh, a flat, uh, flat slicing, this is just chi squared, and so basically the metric is conformal to a Minkowski metric, okay? So if you have a flat FRW, the metric is conformal to Minkowski. What does this mean? It just means that obviously then photons in this case just propagate as in a 
Minkowski space, right? I mean, that's just what it means. So the conformal time, the reason why you introduce conformal time is uh, because it's actually useful for two reasons. The conformal time, so you see that you give, if you want, you give a different weight depending on, on you, get, you give a different weight to time intervals depending on the scale factor A. When the scale factor A is very small, you actually give much more weight, okay? So you're basically weighting the time, if you want, in the case of an expanding universe, you give, you're giving weight to the initial stages where A was small, okay? And so the reason for using the conformal time is because it's very convenient when you do CMB anisotropies. The second reason for using conformal time is that it has a very, very straightforward relation to causality. Let me just give a simple illustration of this. Just trying to see how I'm going down with these blackboards. I'm getting confused. But anyway. Well, uh, <laughs> Does not really matter, but <laughs> I'm just. I hope you're following because I'm not following. <laughs> the blackboards are going up and down. I'm lost already. <laughs> okay. Consider, let me show you why is it important. Consider a particle, okay, with a certain mass, okay, so it's moving on a time lag geodesic, okay. Consider. So, for this particle, right, the space-time interval ds squared, which, okay, using conformal time takes the following form. For such a particle, okay, this time, this uh, line element, obviously, is minus the proper time, square, okay? Because of our convention. Okay? So now I can simply move this data on the other side and take a square root after moving the sign around, and I will get that it goes like plus the square root of a squared times 1 minus gamma ij dxi d eta dxj d eta. Okay? So that describes the change of proper time as measured by this particle with its clock when basically the coordinate time of, the, of this particle changes by the infinitesimal amount d conformal time. Okay? Now what I have here in this parenthesis it's nothing but the co-moving distance traveled by the particle during this infinitesimal amount of time, right? So I mean from the metric from the metric here this piece uh, gives me, without the scale factor, this gives me the co-moving distance traveled by, uh, the co-moving distance square traveled by the particle. So let me write it that way. So I will write it this way, delta SC squared, so the infinitesimal co-moving distance traveled by the particle is, okay, is this where delta xi is the change in the coordinate of the particle during this small time interval, okay?
So if I divide now by d eta square, this is okay, nothing but this. And then I just take the in continuous infinitesimal limit, and so that will give me exactly what is in my square root. Okay, so what is here in the square root is d s c d eta square. Okay, so I can rewrite. I can rewrite this derivative d tau d eta, where tau is the proper time of the particle as this is equal to plus a square root of 1 minus dsc d eta squared. But now this whole quantity, okay, a proper time, it's a, it's a real number. Okay? So the change of proper time has to give me a real number. Uh, so this whole thing is a real number. Okay? So if this is a real number, this implies that what is in the square root, obviously, what is here has to be positive definite, right? Or zero, at most. So this implies that dsc, d eta, has to be less than one. Or equivalently, now I just move the d eta here, and I do an integral on both sides. This implies that the Co-moving distance traveled by the particle So the co-moving distance traveled by the, by the particle, which is this, okay, is bounded by this. Okay, so it's bounded by it's bounded by the conformal time. So the conformal time gives you the maximum distance that any particle can travel in the universe. Okay, so basically, if I sit at a certain point, like I have a certain observer in, in the universe, he will not be able to receive any information beyond a sphere of radius the conformal time, of radius equal to the conformal time. Okay? So this shows that conformal time and causality are very closely connected. Okay? Now let me say um, something about something very important. I skipped the 1.1.2, but I think it was about what I just told you now, okay? The next point is, of course, redshift. So I want uh, to show you how you, I mean, how do you get, I mean, to this cosmological redshift. So, for this, I will consider the propagation of a photon in this idealized homogeneous and isotropic universe. So for photons, okay, in order to describe the trajectory, again, I go back to my metric. ds squared is, uh, now I will write it without the conformal time. It's just more convenient to use the standard cosmic time in this case, so I will write it this way. And for photons, obviously, this has to be exactly zero because it's a light-like geodesic. Now, I want to simplify this a, a bit further, okay, because I have three coordinates here, but I want to choose basically a photon that propagates radially as seen from my coordinate. Okay, so basically, its two angular coordinates are fixed, they don't change with time. So the angular coordinates, in this case, if the photons pro propagate radially, okay, I can just drop them. Okay? So if I look at uh, some radial propagation, then I will set basically 
phi to a constant, theta to a constant. So d phi d theta are zero, they drop from the metric, okay? So the propagation of these photons on these radial lines is described simply by So it's described by minus dt squared plus a squared t times d chi squared. Okay? And this is zero. Now we want to write down an equation of motion for the propagation of this photon. And the way we do it is, well, we basically go to, uh, we write down the Lagrangian for the this photon propagating in, okay, in, in this expanding universe. And then from, that, from a, this Lagrangian, we're going to get um, Euler Lagrange equations. And so the way you can do that, in principle, what you, what you define as the action is an integral of ds, right, which has the square root of minus, okay, in this case, you need to put the minus because it's, well, you actually don't have to. You have the square root, sorry, of, you have the square root of the line element, but you can get rid of the square root and define simply a Lagrangian that will give you the right Euler Lagrange equation of motion. So that's the Lagrangian you can use. Now, what are x mu, what is x mu dot here? It's dx mu d lambda, where lambda is a parameter that basically describes the position of the photon. Okay, so I have the time t here. If you want, I have chi here, and then I have the observer here. There is a photon coming, okay, here. I have dropped the phi and theta degrees of freedom that are irrelevant for this radial propagation. I have the photon here coming this way, from some distant galaxy to the observer on Earth, and I label basically the position of the photon on its geodesic using some affine parameter lambda. And the reason is I cannot use a proper time here because it's not defined for photons. Okay, so I use some some parameter lambda that is a scalar and that grows okay this way. Okay. And so that defines basically the photon for momentum. Um, where am I? So now the Lagrangian, you see, it's basically the... So the Lagrangian takes this form. It's one half of minus t dot squared plus a squared of t chi dot squared, and this is zero. Okay? This is zero because it's just the, the line element. Okay, so I have already a, a certain relation between t dot and chi dot. t dot is a times chi dot. Okay? Now I want to derive the Euler-Lagrange equations. I have the Lagrangian, so Euler-Lagrange, Euler-Lagrange, they take the following form, d, d lambda, which is like the, if you want, the, the time in the story, right, of this partial derivative. And I have two equations. Huh? I have one for t and one for chi, okay? They are the only relevant equations here. Now I see that in this Lagrangian, there is a dependence, an explicit dependence on time t, but there is no dependence on the radial co-moving distance chi. And the reason is the fact that we are working this out in a universe that is homogeneous and isotropic. So there is de no dependence on the radial distance. No explicit dependence. 
So, in other words, we say that chi is cyclic. Maybe you've heard about that. It's cyclic in the Lagrangian. When you have a cyclic coordinate that does not explicitly appear in the Lagrangian, there is an associated conserved momentum. Okay? So the thing that is conserved, obviously, is the following. Since chi is cyclic, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to chi is zero. So for chi, the Euler equation of motion is simply d d lambda dl d chi dot minus zero, okay, equals zero. So this thing is conserved. Okay? Sorry, this is a constant. In other words, since this is nothing but, so this derivative is, is, is nothing but what people would call the canonical covariant photon momentum. This is conserved, and this is equal to well, I just have to take the derivative here, okay, of the Lagrangian with respect to chi dot. So I will get a squared times chi dot. a squared times chi dot is conserved. Okay? And it's really because of homogeneity and isotropy that you get this conservation law. Nice, nice, but... Actually, that's not what the observer on Earth will measure. Okay, what the observer on Earth will measure, if the, pro the observer on Earth will basically measure the projection of this photon form momentum along its velocity. So the observed energy is actually EOPS is minus, so let's write it this way. That's the observed energy. It's, okay, that's the energy observed, for instance, by the observer on Earth. So here, mu, U of mu is the four velocity of the observer. So it's co-moving, okay? So it's basically one, zero, zero, zero for the space component and the time component as one, okay? And P mu is the photon form momentum, covariant here, okay? The mu is down, not up. So we know it's basically there is a P of T that we know for sure. There is also a P of chi, we, co we computed it. And for the theta and phi, zero, okay? Because these degrees of freedom, we just threw them away, okay? So basically, the observed energy is the projection of the photon form momentum on the four velocity of the observer. Okay? That's the most, if you want, the, the covariant definition of what is, what do you measure as an observer? Right? Which energy do you measure? Okay? So we can calculate it. And it's very simple because, because since basically only mu not, okay, the time component is non-zero, this is simply minus P of T, okay? Uh, where do I have to go here? So I go this way. So, the observed energy is minus, let's write it this way, okay, of course, plus zero, so it's only uh, minus P T. Now I can calculate uh, P T. P T, by definition, is DL D T dot, okay? So this is just... Uh, uh, T dot, and I know that T dot, because the Lagrangian is uh, zero, right? I know that T dot is A times chi dot. Okay, so this is A times chi dot. 
And then I can use this conservation law to write this as P chi divided by A, where P chi is constant, okay? Okay? So then let's say, so then there is some, uh, sorry, there is a minus sign here. Huh? All the way. So let's do the following. Let's just write it this way. Minus sign here and minus sign there, okay? Minus P of T is minus this, then this gives me the plus T, okay? Minus sign and all that. Okay, so the observed energy is P chi divided by A, so it scales like A to the minus one. And now the observer on Earth, obviously in its local frame, it can use rel relations from spatial relativity, right? In its local frame. So in its local frame, we have that the observed energy that he measures minus the observed momentum of the photon is zero, okay? So this implies that obviously the observed momentum as measured by the observer on Earth is the energy of the photon as measured and is, this goes also like one over A, okay? So that's the redshift. So basically what you, what you have here is You can write this slightly differently. That's what people do. What people do, they do the following. Physical momentum, observed momentum, goes like one over a wavelength, lambda. So this conservation, this scaling implies that lambda observed divided by lambda, lambda emitted. So the wavelength as measured by the observer on Earth divided by the wave, wavelength at the time of emission of the photon in the range of that distance galaxy. This is, uh, let me make sure the things, yes. This is A, at the, the scale factor at the time of observation divided by the scale factor of the universe at the time of emission. So then you introduce, you introduce the redshift Z, you define it as follows. One plus Z is one over the scale factor. And that allows you to rewrite this expression as one plus the redshift at the time of emission divided by one plus the redshift as the, at the time of observations, okay? So with the convention I told you about with the convention that today at time at cosmic time t naught the scale factor which has no dimension okay in my convention is unity okay if I do the measurement today the z ops here would be basically zero All right z today fits the z op is zero so the ratio of wavelength goes like Okay, gives me the cosmological redshift one plus Z emission. So this implies that if like, uh, for instance, this implies that if a uh, photon was emitted by a distant galaxy when the universe was, uh, let's say, uh, what could we choose here? Uh, let's say, three times smaller, so A is one third, the redshift will be two, okay? So the wavelength will have expanded by a factor of two, okay? So you have to realize that that's a huge effect right? <laughs> because when, when you talk about gravitational redshift, okay, around the Earth or, I mean, you basically talk about redshift induced by fluctuations in the gravitational potential and these fluctuations, okay, around Earth or in the solar system, they are small of the order of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4, okay? This is a huge effect. Right? It's a factor of 2 uh, on the wavelength. If the galaxy is, emit, if you see the galaxies as it was when the universe was basically one half smaller in radius, okay? So it's a huge effect. The second thing is that for an expanding universe, a universe that is expanding, it's always a redshift. You're always redshifting, 
Okay, when you have gravitational redshift, you could have blue shift or redshift depending on where the observer and where the emitter are. Here it always, it's always symmetric and it always, it's always a redshift. The third thing to notice is also the fact that when you do this calculation, there is, I, I'm not doing any integral along the line of sight. So it's not really accumulating, it's not really a cumulative effect. Uh, I, I think the, here the, if you want, the understanding is that it, it's, this redshift, this cosmological redshift comes from the fact that if you want the frame of the emitter and the frame of the observer, they are fundamentally different frames. Okay? But you can find in books calculation where they do actually a line of sight integral. But this is why I wanted really to show that that's, you can avoid that and do things differently. Um, last point. I did this calculation for a photon, a massless particle. But actually any massive freely propagating particle in the universe has is momentum, physical momentum, scale like 1 over A. So it's very general. It does not only applies for photons, but for any freely propagating particle in the universe. Okay? I don't know if you have some questions, but I think it's probably good to have just a five minute break. I just need to get some water for those of you who want to go to the restroom and then we, we go on. Is that okay? So let's just have a five minutes break. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go on. One last thing. I, didn't, I won't have time and I didn't plan anyway to talk about distances. How do you define distances in an expanding universe is, uh, is not trivial. There is no unique way of doing that. I won't discuss this, but that will be discussed somewhat during the exercise session this afternoon. Okay, so, so I will move to the second part of uh, this lecture today, which uh, is about, uh, which focuses on the Friedman-Robertson-Walker equations. And so to start with, I just want to briefly describe, uh, recap what, so what's, what is the energy momentum tensor of the universe then in this approximation of, uh, of an idealized uh, homogeneous and isotropic uh, universe. So in general, You will write, you can write the energy momentum tensor the following way. I will tell you uh, shortly what are the different components here. Uh, but before I do that, we need first of all some convention. Okay, so mu is supposed to describe the flow of the fluid. The question is, which flow are we looking at? Are we looking at, at the flow of particle or are we looking at, at the flow of energy? Okay? What do we want to use for this four velocity U of mu? So if you have a perfect fluid, this question basically, the answer does not matter because everything has to flow the same way. But if you have imperfect fluids, I mean particles might flow differently than energy. Okay? So I will stick to the, I will stick to the standard convention in cosmology, which is, to, which is basically to, to uh, define the fluid for velocity u of mu as describing the flow of energy. Okay, it's a convention. And it's known also as Landau frame or Landau convention. Okay, so basically, this for an imperfect fluid, the flow of energy might be different from the flow of, of particle in the sense of, of, of a mass, mass of the particle times the, the motion of the particle, okay? So, in other words, if I write, like I define like a, a current G of mu, okay, this way, this current, rho times, where rho is the energy density in the fluid rest frame, and U of mu is the observed flow of energy as seen by some observer. This is really, this is really the flow of energy, right? So it's all the energy current. And so basically this energy current, a current can, includes all, can include all forms of energies flowing, including, for instance, heat conduction, okay? So it's not only particle flowing from one position to another position, but that also be heat conduction, okay, et cetera, et cetera. So. Hmm? 
So this being said, now let's look at the different pieces here. So first of all, let me write down. So now U of mu is the fluid for velocity, OK? I, with understanding that it, de it describes energy flow, as seen by some observer. As seen by some observer. So the observer, might, he might not be at rest with the fluid. Okay, so he might see the fluid moving and he would assign a certain velocity u of mu to this fluid, okay, at each position. Um, then this piece is called the stress tensor. So it basically encodes the effect of conservative and non-conservative forces on the flow. Okay. And so you can split it into, uh, if you want, into an isotropic piece. And then on some like anisotropic piece or something known also as the shear stress. So this shear stress must also satisfy certain conditions when you do this splitting. So it, it basically it has to be symmetric because the energy momentum tensor is symmetric. And then with the convention that U of mu defines the flow of energy, you have the fact that it is transverse. So the scalar product, I mean, this is zero, OK? And then it is also traceless, okay. Well. And so it typically, this shear stress will typically include, for instance, shear viscosity. So if you want, I mean, this isotropic piece will describe like isotropic expansion of or contraction of your fluid element, okay this or that, while this piece will de describe like anisotropic okay, deformation of the fluid volume element, okay? Something like, like this, oh, uh, okay, or the opposite, <laughs> okay, got it. Um, and then one last and important word, then we have, of course, what are these functions P and rho? This function P and rho, they are the energy density and pressure as measured in the fluid rest frame, okay? As measured in the fluid rest frame. Okay. So it's important also to say uh, one more thing here is that what about the, the pressure? So the energy density includes the, the rest mass and the internal energy. The pressure includes actually two potentially two components, the usual equilibrium thermodynamic pressure and possibly a viscous, a viscous pressure, which could come from some bulk viscosity. What do I mean? If you have a perfect fluid, if you expand or compress volumes, you immediately relax to equilibrium pressure. But if you have an imperfect fluid with some viscosity, you might expand or compress volumes, and you will not immediately relax to the equilibrium pressure. There will be an extra pressure which has to do with this viscosity. So if you have an imperfect fluid, this pressure P might include an extra component, would include an extra component, which would be this, this pressure induced by this bulk vis viscosity. Okay? But for, let's say, for realistic fluids in the early universe, this is usually, I think, completely negligible. I mean, 
Okay, so P will in P basically will be the uh, um, the usual equilibrium thermodynamic pressure. Okay. So now, uh, what about, uh, okay, so what can we do? This is a fairly general description of the energy momentum tensor. We need to specialize it to our problem, which is a universe that is homogeneous and isotropic. So homogeneity, homogeneity and isotropy of the universe basically imposes two constraints on, uh, on the form of T mu nu. Okay, so it's obviously what I want to describe is the energy momentum tensor as seen by co-moving observer in the universe, okay? So this co-moving observer, they see a universe which is homogeneous and isotropic. So the stress, there cannot be any preferred direction, which means that the four velocity of the fluid, no preferred, or if you want, which means that the fluid has to be at rest as seen by a co-moving observer in the universe. Okay, otherwise there will be some specific preferred direction, okay? So the fluid is at rest as seen by a co-moving observer. Okay, so this implies that the fluid velocity is this with the usual cosmic time. So the, that's the contravariant component. So the covariant component, you just have to put a minus one here. Okay? You bring down with the metric, which is minus one, you remember, for the time time. So that's what you get. Okay? And then uh, that's the first condition. And then the second condition, obviously, is the fact that because everything is isotropic, I cannot have any shear stress because I'm telling you shear stress are anisotropic deformation of fluid elements. Okay, that cannot happen in an isotropic universe. So there is no shear stress. Okay, so I said simply pi mu nu equals zero. So it's simple, right? So then the form, I can go here actually. So then for our FRW, Okay, universe, what actually we need to consider is this. And I will simply ignore any basically bulk viscosity, okay, viscous pressure here, and I will take the pressure to be the usual equilibrium thermodynamic pressure. Basically, whenever I expand this fluid element or compress them, I immediately relax to equilibrium, okay? So now you can work them, okay, with these two conditions, you get to that, and then it's relatively easy now to work out the components. So in components, so we have T00 is, uh, it's gonna be zero, uh, rho. Then we have that the mixed component actually vanish. Okay. And then we have that Tij is P Gij, which I can write also as P A square gamma Ig. Okay? So they are the component of the energy momentum tensor compatible with the assumptions of the FRW uh, metric and universe. Okay? And so obviously this comes also with conservation law, local conservation law of uh, energy and momentum. Uh, so the conservation law is where this is a covariant derivative, okay? So that's very general, but what is important is that it's local, okay? It's local conservation of energy and momentum. And because in general relativity, there is, I mean, generically, no global conservation law of energy, okay? It's local, as we will see later. Uh, that is to say, so wh what you do, uh, one more thing which is important is that when you, uh, when you have different species in the universe, Okay, like dark matter, photons, baryons, okay, the total 
obviously energy uh, momentum tensor is the sum okay of all the energy momentum tensors okay over all the the species and then when these species when you have like one species for instance like dark matter uh, does not interact with any of the other species except gravitationally Okay, but gravity is not basically here. Okay, it's not really including here the gravitational interaction. Okay, so when one of these species does not interact with any of the other species, then you have like a specific conservation law for that species. Okay, so for instance, for dark matter, you would have T mu nu for dark matter, which is zero. But when you have, for instance, baryons and photons, and they do interact with each other, okay, they can exchange energy and momentum, then you cannot write d mu, d mu for the baryons equals zero, d mu for the photons equals zero. It's going to be the sum will be conserved, for instance, okay, but not each of them separately, okay? Now, <clears throat> now uh, let's go to the equations. So the Friedman equation, so so I won't derive them because I mean it's just a it's not a useless pain, it's a useful pain, but you do it once. So what I've done in the what I've done in my notes, I've done the following. Uh, yeah, let me. I, I thought you were doing like uh, when I said there is no gravitational energy here, because you see this this quantity this this is local, okay? Gravitational energy in general relativity you cannot localize it, okay? I mean, what you could try to do you could try to do some twist and define an energy momentum tensor that includes the gravitational interaction, but I mean, what you really have here is that you have all form of interactions except gravity, okay? Because you, there is no you cannot localize gravitational energy simply, okay? You cannot write it down this way. Although there are, I mean, I'm saying if you open Misner, Thorn, Wheeler, you will see that there are certain ways, you know, of, of doing this, okay? Now, um, regarding the Friedman equations, what you have to solve is that you have to solve Einstein equations, okay? For this particular metric and energy momentum tensor. So let me see my convention. So you have you have to be a bit careful with the conventions of sign. I mean, uh, let me just write them down. This is the Einstein tensor, which is uh, this, where R is the Ricci tensor, the Ricci curvature, and this I put plus eight pi g t mu nu. Okay, and now you solve. It's really turning the crank. Okay, you go, you start from the Friedman Robertson Walker metric. You go to the Christoffel symbols, you compute them. Okay, then from the Christoffel symbols, you compute the Riemann curvature tensor. Then you contract the Riemann curvature tensor, you get to the Ricci tensor. You contract the Ricci tensor, you get the Ricci, Ricci curvature. You get the Einstein tensor. You put your uh, energy momentum tensor on the right hand side. You solve. Okay. It's good that you do it once in your life. So if you haven't done it, you can do it this afternoon, for instance. What I did is the following. What I wrote down in my note is a slightly different derivation based on differential geometry. So for those who are familiar with differential geometry, so here is a derivation where you basically go through the curvature form, etc., etc. So those who are interested and, for instance, would finish the exercise session relatively quickly, they can go through this cal calculation and try to do it. If you have any question, you can come to me. Okay? In any case... I won't do it, it's not very interesting, but I think it's, it's good to do it once, okay? So let me just jump to these equations, what they are. So because of homogeneity and isotropy, you basically end up with two equations. So homogeneity and isotropy of space, you end up with two equations, one for the time-time components and basically one for the ii components, okay? So there are the two Friedman equations. So for the 
for, for the time time, you get the following h squared plus the curvature k, which is time independent, divided by a squared equals 8 pi g 3 rho. And, okay, I added also explicitly a cosmological constant in case you added explicitly here in Einstein equations, okay? So then you would have lambda divided by 3, okay? Which would follow from adding on this side, adding a plus lambda g mu nu, okay? And then the second one, ij, so, so it's the same for ii equals 1, 2, or 3, obviously, because of isotropy. And that gives you 2a double dot divided by a plus h squared plus k divided by a squared equals minus 8 pi g p plus lambda. And so I think now I realize that I have not defined what the Hubble rate is, so it's probably time to do it now. What is age? We didn't really use it, I mean, and need it until now, but uh, now it's time. Age is the Hubble rate. And so it's defined as a dot divided by a, okay? Well, here I'm using uh, the standard cosmic time, okay, just to say. So it basically describes the rate of expansion of, of the universe, okay? And so you can show that, you can show one thing, you, you will probably not do it today, but I, I told you about distances. I told you that you can define all kinds of di distances in this expanding universe. There is no unique way of defining a distance. But there is something important, is that in the limit of small distances, okay, which would imply basically short time propagation interval for photons, all the distances reduce to the Hubble law, which I have to write because, <laughs> well, actually, the, according to the International Astronomical Union, this law has changed to the Hubble Lemaitre. <laughs> okay, let me call it Hubble law in any case. So basically, the physical distance, okay, which you could only define if the time of emission is very close to the time of observation, otherwise it would not make any sense, the universe is expanding. The physical distance is given, is proportional, uh, sorry, it's the opposite. Uh, you, observed, you, ob you, can, you observe the cosmological redshift, when the emitter is close to the observer, you can basically translate this into a simple Doppler shift, okay, which you would write as a recessional velocity, V. Okay. This observed velocity uh, shift is proportional to the proper distance between the source and you, okay, and the constant of proportionality is the Hubble rate basically today, because we will do the measurement today. Okay. So this is the famous Hubble constant. Which I and so today it's approximately edge naught is approximately seventy kilometer per second pen per meter minus one up to some uncertainties which uh, cosmologists uh, today are uh, some of them are really worried about okay <laughs> but I won't go into this at the moment okay. Um, so I need to do some selection, a bit of uh, topics. I probably, I, I, I point also out in my notes that you could also use um, energy momentum conservation to derive another equation. We can use basically the continuity. You could also use, instead, instead, instead of starting from Einstein equations, you could start from the, what I mean by continuity equation is this, okay? Ener local energy momentum conservation, that's what I mean, okay? To derive additional equations. 
And actually, if uh, you look at this a bit more, let me uh, say something. So this you would split that way. First of all, you can set new is i, okay? But this is basically tri tri trivially satisfied because, um, because of the following fact. So you write this as covariant derivative of this plus this, okay? So this is zero, t zero i is zero, so it drops. And then this piece, remember, it goes with the pressure times the metric gij, okay? So now the covariant derivative acts on this and then acts on that, so it gives you covariant derivative of p times this plus p times covariant derivative of the metric. But this is zero because, first of all, the pressure is homogeneous. It does not depend on position. And then, well, you're using Einstein theory, and Einstein theory assumes that the metric, the, 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 the connections are metric. What's, what's, what do I mean is that when you do a scalar product, okay, between two vectors, you have two vectors, uh, you have a certain scalar product between them at a, at a certain point of the space time, right now you, you basically parallel transport these two vectors to another point of the metric, you require the scalar product to be the same. And in order to have this requirement, in order to satisfy this condition, you must have that the covariant derivative of the metric is zero. So this term is zero, and this is trivially zero. So there is no interesting information, information in, this, in, this continue, in this part of the continuity uh, equations, okay? There is interesting information in the part where nu equals zero. So you can do the calculation. It's in my note in detail. Go, just go through it. I mean, at the end, what you find is the following. So this piece, as I said, this is not completely trivial, and that would give you the following. After some manipulation, you get to this. But you have extra relations in general relativity. You have something called Bianchi identities. So actually, this relation, you can derive it by combining the two Friedman equations, okay? So you go a bit around, okay? But the bottom line is that there are basically fundamentally two equations, which you can rewrite in different ways, okay? Sometimes it's useful to have the first Friedman plus discontinuity equations, okay? Especially when you want to solve for universes with like a specific rho and pressure. Um, so let me move just briefly to uh, like a few cosmo cosmological models, and I will I will stop here. So first of all. Uh, sorry, there is something confusing. The I, I is not for K, of course. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, I will do the following. You can include, you can absorb the cosmological constant here into the pressure and the density. So I will just ignore this. Okay, you just redefine the pressure as the sum of the standard pressure plus this pressure and density coming from cosmological constant. So you see that there is something interesting with the first Friedman equation is that, uh, well, there is some critical density for which you see the universe will be flat. Where k equals zero will give you a certain critical density. And then when k is negative, if k is negative, so when, when you have an hyperbolic space, I mean here, then you need a density that is slightly lower than this critical density. Right? While, while when k is positive, you need a rho that is larger than this critical density. Okay, so the different, basically, uh, geometries of this, uh, of this spatial section of constant time, they are related to different values of the density. And there is a critical value for flat Euclidean uh, spatial, uh, spatial sections. So this critical density, you see it, uh, you set K. So you get it, you basically set K equals zero. And that implies that the first Friedman equation tells you that rho, which is now the rho critical, is 
geometry, h squared divided by 8 pi g. And then it's convenient to introduce something known as energy density parameter. And in cosmology, people like to write it as capital omega. And so this capital omega is the ratio between the energy density in your universe to the critical energy density. So when omega is exactly one, you have a flat FRW universe. When omega is larger than one, so then you need to have a closed, okay? What did I do? Oh, I just removed those equations. When you have, uh, <laughs> okay, omega equals one, you have flat. Omega greater than one, then I need to add some positive contribution from the curvature, right, on the left-hand side, so it's closed, okay? Closed. And then when omega is less than one, it's open. Okay, closed or hyperspheres and open, typically a hyperbolic geometry, okay? Now, let me just go back to this uh, first Friedman equation. So you can actually move things a bit around to rewrite it in a different way, basically using this energy density parameter. You can do the following, you can introduce like some sort of ev effective energy coming from the curvature, although there is no real energy here. But it's convenient to, to introduce like a curvature parameter. Which you define as minus uh, k divided by a h squared. Okay, so you see that if you do that, then you can do the following. You can, uh, let me use some different color for sake of change. So if I divide everything by h bar, okay, I'm here I'm, you see I make the one over the critical density appear, so this is equal to omega. And here what I have is minus this curvature parameter, omega k. Okay, so I have one minus omega k equals omega, or equivalently, I have one equals to omega plus omega k. So it's another way of writing down the first Friedman equation. Okay? Um, one more thing also about these omegas. You see them in the literature often, but it's not clear, you know, so sometimes, are they defined at t today or t at, uh, at uh, any time? I mean, I will use the following convention. Actually, when I write omega, so omega for any species x, I mean it's the energy density of that species today. Okay? And when I write omega uh, x of t or or z, or whatever you want. I mean, this is really the time-dependent omega. I think red is not good. So basically, the first Friedman equation, what I mean is one equals omega k of t plus omega of t. And then into omega, obviously it's rho divided by, rho divided by rho critical at any time t. And here, if I have dark matter, baryons, photons, I just split omega into the sum over the energy densities of each of these species, okay? And I, I just end up with the sum of the omegas, right? So this will be the sum of species x of rho x of t 
divided by rho critical of t, and so that becomes a sum over all the x of omega x of t. Okay? So, okay, this being said, now let's say probably something quick about, you know, what are the solutions, at least, of this Friedman equation in a, a few simple cases. So in order to have, to find solutions, obviously, you need to specify what are rho and p. I mean, in principle, you know, it could be complicated. I mean, it could be complicated function of time. But fortunately, in the most relevant cases, you have a simple relation between P and Rho. And so, uh, there, are basically three, uh, there are basically three relevant cases. And, okay, basically, three fundamental cases. And in each of these cases, the equation of state, there is an equation of state, okay, P as a function of rho, which takes the simple form, it is linear. P of rho is basically some constant time rho. So you have the case, first of all, of obviously non-relativistic matter or dust. Non-relativistic dust. Okay, so that's the first case. In this case, the pressure, the internal pressure, is basically completely negligible relative to the rest mass. Okay? Uh, because the internal pressure will go like something like a mass times the sound speed square. Okay? You have P goes like mass times sound speed square. But you have that the energy density goes basically like the rest mass, which is M times C squared. Okay, now it, the ratio between the two is goes like CS divided by C square, which for like realistic sound speeds uh, of non-relativistic gas or dust, this is much, much less than one. So basically P is much smaller than rho. So in a good approximation, you take omega is zero. Okay? The second, of course, case is relativistic. You have a relativistic distribution of particles. And then you know that the pressure matters. If you remember your thermodynamic or statistical mechanic class, if you have relativistic particles, then the pressure goes basically like one-third of rho. Okay, so I have omega is one-third. Here I had omega equals zero. Omega is one-third. And then of, there is a third case which is really relevant in cosmology, which is basically the you know, cosmological constant. Because we have strong line of evidence that there is a non-zero cosmological constant. And so for a cosmological constant, the equation of state is uh, bizarre because the pressure is actually negative. Okay, it's minus rho, which implies that, sorry. The pressure is minus rho, which implies that omega is minus one. Okay? And so once you have done this, you can basically use Friedman equations. Actually, one of them is enough, okay, because now you have P as a function of rho, okay, so use one of them, and in particular, the continuity equation is useful. I mean, then to solve for, you know, the behavior, what you want to, what you want to find is the behavior of the scale factor as a function of time. So you can use the continuity equation. Okay, times rho plus P. So you will write this P is omega times rho, so this is minus 3h times 1 plus omega times rho. And then, basically, you do a bit of massage. So you write this this way, you move the rows on this sign. H, H times dt gives you dA, okay? dA divided by A, so you get this. 
which we solve as rho of a goes like a to the minus 3 times 1 plus omega. Okay? From this. So, it's perfect. We will basically conclude here. So, what, what, what do I learn here? Well, I learned that the energy density, you see, the energy density depends on the equation of state of the species, you know, I'm considering. So for non-relativistic dust, omega is zero. So the scale factor in this case goes like, uh, the energy density, sorry, goes like the scale factor to the minus three. For relativistic particles, I have this extra one third here, so that gives me a to the minus four. And then for a, cosmological, for a cosmological constant, what do I get? Well, the energy density remains constant, right? Otherwise, it would not make sense. It's a cosmological constant. <laughs> so let's put this on one and the unique plot of this first lecture. <laughs> Okay, so you all, you've all seen this. Energy density, scale factor. So by convention, my scale factor, uh, again, there's no dimension. It's normalized to unity today. So this is one, this is today. Let's look at the relativistic particles first. So it has an energy density that decays the fastest with the expansion. So presumably dominated in the early universe. So there is a phase in the early universe where this was the dominant component, and this phase is called radiation era or radiation dominated era. Let's call it RD. Okay, here. So I have rho, let me write, uh, that would be rho of relativistic particle, rho of R. And then at some point, obviously, this energy density will decays faster than the energy density of non-relativistic dust. This energy density will become equal to the energy density in non-relativistic dust. And so I have here like a transition which is known as matter radiation equality. Matter radiation <laughs> equality. Um, below which it's the non-relativistic dust that takes over, okay? So that would be what people called rho m for standard non-relativistic matter. And then obviously this rho m will decay at some point, it will be uh, you know, less than the energy density of the cosmical constant. And so we have actually a third era, which is lambda dominated. So this is matter domination. And then we have like lambda domination, okay? And so when the when basically rho matter drops below rho lambda. And this happened approximately at a redshift of two. Okay, so a, a scale factor of approximately one third. Okay, this happened approximately at a redshift of uh, 3000. Okay, so scale factor of the order of 10 to the minus four. Okay, that corresponds, if you put a timeline, which I won't have the time to do so, that corresponds to approximately uh, like uh, 100,000 years after uh, the, the Big Bang, <laughs> okay? And this corresponds to uh, something like a few billion years after, okay? So, okay, I will stop here for this first lecture. If you have any question, feel free to ask around lunch or I guess. Yeah, thank you. Questions or... Yeah, I move this.